everybody. My name is Sharon Sherry. I'm the director of the Jones Library here in Amherst, and I am here at Leveler's Press with Steve Strymer, the founder of Leveler's Press, and Anna Mullen, one of the worker owners here at Leveler's. And I thought we would sit and chat and learn more about your organization. And I thought we'd start with you, Steve, and talk about the history of the press. It's, it's interesting. There's so many different ways to think about how it happened, because it kind of happened and grew on its own. Um, I'm a, I've been a printer for since 1973, offset presses and things like that. I was in a, another worker co-op, and part of my job there was to shoot film for producing halftones, photographs in printed material. That was, I was a camera operator, a plate maker, and that kind of person as well as a press operator. So I learned offset and I, I, I love the way you know of making photographs in offset and the impression of putting the ink into the paper and having the dots just right you know all that. So I, I came over here after 20 years offset I came over to Collective Copies in 1997 and it was a really different world we were still at 300 DPI. I think people out there know what DPI is. Still at 300 DPI when I came, we were still, we still had floppy disks. Yes. We still had all, you know, we had no, I think we might have just started to have PDF files, Acrobat files. None of them were very stable. You had to watch them like a hawk, because, all right. So, but gradually, as we worked on, we got color copier, we had our first color copier. A majestic. It couldn't do anything. It couldn't print on cardstock very well. It was constantly jamming. Color wasn't good. Um, but then we, we like to call it the Rico Suave. <laughs> There's all these brands, and right now we, we have a lot of, I'll say it, Xerox machines. Um, but uh, the Rico Suave was the first machine, production copy machine, that could print at 1200 DPI. Okay. And it allowed photographs to be produced almost like offset. Not quite, but almost like offset. So as a camera operator and somebody who cared about halftones, it really kind of floated my boat. And within short order, in 2004, we had this series of uh, books for the Northampton Historical Commission. And were able to produce some of uh, Stan Shearer's photographs here at wow. that higher resolution, and it just became very exciting. Yes. So it was really in 2004 we started to print books, and one of our very first books uh, that we published, not yet as Leveler's Press, but as uh, Collective Copies still. We published six books as Collective Copies, and this was the first one. No kidding. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> so one of the sort of cutest titles ever for a book, right? Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002, one of the best small towns in America. Absolutely. Okay. So that was, uh, and one of our great uh, local folks, Vince Cleary, wrote the book. And it remains a decent seller, but it's one of our books that went over a thousand copies wow. in sales over time, wow. which is pretty impressive. Yeah. And um, that we were able to print it. This is a Bodoni typeface, very fine serifs and have the serifs be nice and clear. is really gives this fellow's heart, you know, uh, flew in his chest to know what we could do, right? So by uh, 2009, um, a friend of mine on the Sojourner Truth Memorial Statue Committee approached us about publishing his book, and this was our first book as Leveler's, Slavery in the Connecticut Valley. Beautiful. And uh, he, um, he encouraged us to think of a name and so I had read a little bit about the Levelers in England who fought to preserve the common land against the, the encroachment of the nobles. And I thought that would be a good name. I like the name of it. Plus, the idea that, and, and it very quickly dawned on me that leveling the playing field in publishing, because he, at that point, and it's continued, you know, big publishers, the nightmares a lot of our customers were having, because um, we 
we would publish manuscript after, we would print manuscript after manuscript as they were pitching their books to big publishers. Sure. And even if they got picked up, they complained to us about the process. Wow. So we wanted to make a process that was happy and author friendly. Beautiful. And, um, and, and Robert, um, Bob Romer, he wanted his uh, <clears throat> periods outside the quotation marks. No kidding. <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay, we'll do that. Okay. He, that's the English stylist. Okay. He wanted it done that way. So that's fascinating. So that's, that's how it started. Okay. And a hundred or more titles later. Um, I guess one of my other questions was, um, so, so <coughs> in all your years, what, what changes in the technology or in, in, in publishing have you changed? They must be immense. Other than just the DPI. Yeah, we're up to 2,400 DPI now. Very good. Very good. Crazy. Um, and um, I don't know how technical you want to get about get to be about this, um, but we're, we can print, and the sheet size changed. The biggest mm. sheet size used to be 1117. Yeah. That was a typical one. Um, and I don't want to get too technical about it. For which, when you ran an 1117, you you paid twice as much as you did for an 8 half average. They then moved up to 1218. The Rico Suave could do 1218, which was great. And then they moved up to 1319, which allowed you to print a standard trade paperback book, six by nine, four up. Wow. Right? And I'll just put it out there for one service click, for one, as though it was an eight and a half, 11. Now, that's really what made things possible. And that became the way Xerox and Canon and Rico and all those companies were competing with each other. Sure, sure. So they all sort of together went that down that road. Wow. And that allowed a lot of things to happen. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. I think another challenge that I see kind of on the horizon is thinking about to what degree we want to solicit and by solicit how we want to solicit new work. Um, How do what, you what voices are we are we looking for that we don't already have oh. um, and how how do we kind of keep the literal means of like book production accessible to people who come on come in off the street and have an idea that they you know want to share so how do you balance that accessibility um, and a certain kind of like equity in publishing with um, maintaining certain standards and doing it when, with, you know, when you're understaffed. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think those two things are in any way naturally at odds, mm -hmm. like having, mm -hmm. wanting to make yourself accessible to people and wanting your books to be good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's a problem. It can it can become a problem to be solved, I suppose, in certain instances um, where you have two values, two collective values that that can be at odds. Which is, we want this person to be able to distribute their work, and how involved do we want to be in it? Do we want to just be printing the books? Do we want to be printing the books and be a semi-distributor responsible for maintaining a catalog? Mm -hmm. Do we want to and definitely maintain books on our shelves? And you know that answer really varies on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. And I think having that flexibility to respond on a case-by-case -case basis is, it, is important, but streamlining that and making it more clear from the intake process to customers is something that we're going to be working on, I think. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I mean, this is a whole new step for us yeah. to, um, because more people are involved. This kind of used to be my baby, uh -huh. and the collective as a whole kind of said, yeah, you take in the titles you want and, okay. you know, make them work. Yeah. Um, but, but it's something different, it's becoming something much different, okay. so it has to become clearer. Yeah. And we need to listen to each other about uh, what what makes sense and what we should be doing and, okay. and all and that. And do you all One agree things, mostly? What's that? Oh, do you all agree mostly? Is it, uh, it's new enough. This may be our third book committee meeting as okay. the larger group, something as like that. Group, something yeah. like that. 
So it's we're still finding okay. that. I, I'm not too concerned for the scale that we're like operating on. Um, I think I think it's a sustainable model. People want books. The more the world becomes isolated and isolating, and that experience intensifies for people. The more important it is that they have handheld things. Um, and we get to do a lot of that that work here. It's really exciting. Um, and um, so we we have our, our. Well, I have to say that's such an awesome response, right? I love. I, we get in the library world. We get asked this question all the time. What are you going to yeah. do when the books are no longer needed? And it's just not the case. It's not the case. People need stories. People need and and the physical book. It's not going to be replaced anytime soon. No, I don't think it's going to be replaced ever. I think that the way in which we publish is going to change dramatically, like on a on a global scale. Um, in terms of what we offer here, though, I think the demand is only growing because people really want to see their words and images like bound in a book, and we kind of accelerate that process and and I think make it more intimate and. Um, there aren't a lot of places that, that do that. So to be able to, within a couple of weeks or you know a month, take something from a, a digital file to a product somebody can hold is, is not a feeling that I, I think is, you know, the demand for that feeling is not shrinking. Uh, if anything, I think it's growing. And how amazing that must feel for each of you to be able to work with these authors and to start with, the, the, you know, these are their babies, and and for you to bring those babies to life, that must feel so good. Yeah. Oh, it really does. And and to live in an area where there's so many people who have those skills and talents, and you know, they're variable. That's part of our job is to figure out what they know, what they can, what level of. And this is another big issue before us, is what yeah. level of editorial oh. help we can be yeah. or want to be and be able to bill for. You know, we, that's, we're coming to this as a coffee shop, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's not an editorial house or it's e not even a design house. Right. But it's pushing us that way because and it keeps happening. Okay. And a lot of us are, you know, read a lot and know a lot. Um, as we're succeeding kind of beyond I mean, what do you do when something succeeds beyond your expectations? Uh -huh. It's like uh -huh. when you're chasing after it. Yes. That's, there's another challenge. It's a great problem That's to a, have. It's, you think so. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's exhausting. <laughs> you think so. At, at age 70, you know, I'm kind of thinking what, what is, what does winding down a little bit, I'm not wanting to, wanting to wind down a lot. I'm so lucky to be doing what I love. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But uh, yeah. I don't really want to have the stress, of, some of the stresses that happen. Um, and I probably don't deserve not to have them, but I kind of want. Yeah. Um, uh, the other interesting thing, uh, interesting problem for us uh, compared to yeah. other small publishers yeah. is that we have no relationship with any national distributor. Uh, huh. You probably know all about Ingram and yeah. Perseus and those kind of, yeah. those kind of places because the, as much as uh, we've been able to have our costs be affordable, yep. The unit cost on short run printing, right? Our average run for a book as it launches is maybe 250 in its first six months. Okay. Like that might be the average. Yeah. Well, that doesn't allow you to have a unit cost that lets you use a distributor who wants to buy your books at 45 percent of the retail price, which is below cost in a sense. So wow. you, we can't even do that. Yeah. So back to the challenge: How do you not have that reach? Right, and, we, and part of uh, part of our mission from the get-go was to have this ferment of the Pioneer Valley yes. and, and here it get out beyond us to yeah. get our authors out into the world. How do you do that when you don't have that that reach? Sure. Um, I, I I don't want to say this, but one of the only ways we can do it is to, and we're fighting, we're dealing with this right now, is to go with Big Brother, you know, oh. and that um, and. Uh, and that is difficult for us because we want people, and it makes sense from a retail, we want them to buy from us at yes. full retail. Yes. We don't want anybody to take a cut. That's a different thing. Um, that's part of it, and we want them not to go with Big Brother, who's taking over everything. Yes. You know, um, 
but uh, and like I said, I deem a, a book a success when it sells 250 copies. After I'm not saying after that it's all gravy, because some of these books want to do more yeah, uh, sure. and deserve to do more, and you wish you could know what to do to have them do, do more. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I'd say our market, you know, we're we're redeveloping our our eblast list and trying to have it be look more professional and and having people opt into it it takes time to rebuild a list that was just all my friends and emails yes. back in the day now it wants to be we want to gradually build a, a almost like a subscriber list That's and, a full -time and we haven't job. talked about what we might do it <laughs> to have people look forward to, I, I always imagine levelers finally to be where people would look forward to your next title yes. and want to get it. Yes. Um, but don't you also <laughs> want to attract the authors that you're interested in publishing? And so um, going back to that, is small town feel, is that is that fair? Um, you know, if you were distributing more and more books per year, does that take away from what authors are looking for or and why they're attracted to you? Or do you think not? I would say not on the scale we're talking about. When you talk to like an, you know, 2,000 is really not that big of a, a run. That's a small run that's, in our that's world. That's kind of the regular run for small publishers. Yeah, so if we're talking about the difference between us selling 250 and 2,000, we're, we're going to want to, you know, sell more if we can. But, um, yeah, I think everyone has a different, every author walking through the door has a different number in their head in terms of what they're already mm -hmm. thinking in terms of their network. Sure. Some people come in and they want to have a perfect bum book ready for Christmas for their whole extended family. They want 45 copies or something like that. And then some people come in and they're like, I have a mailing list of 1,500 people and like, let's go with this number. So I think, I don't think that the way we're talking about scaling detracts from any of like the small the small feel of what we're doing. Um, when you're back there in the bindery, it's all kind of once you reach a certain quantity, it's all kind of the same work. It's all the same, yeah. right? When you agree, sure. the only the only difference I feel like is where do we put the books? Yeah. It's like a big thing. Like storing two thousand books is different well, from storing two hundred books. So. Well, I mean, until we go out to offset, and this is back to, because this just really happened, this is brand new discussion, right? Wow. So, if, and this is for people through the Off the Common, uh, through the Off the Common, where they own the books, where, yes. we're, where everything yes. is a bill to them, <laughs> they're, the pub, they're the publisher, we assist them in that. We'll get it right. Um, if they commit to a thousand books, mm -hmm. we can print them, as long as we keep them in stock, right. they can be virtual, they, you know, they, the collapse of the wave function, it becomes yeah. a book, yeah. uh, as opposed to storing boxes and boxes yeah, it's of an books, agreement. right? Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. um, as long as, as they commit to that count. Yeah. And the other thing it does sometimes, they can, and this happens a lot, they can change that typo on page 150. That's true, yes. <laughs> I can see yeah. the benefit to that, sure. <laughs> sure. It's, it's, it actually, I get, I, I get a kick out of doing that, you know, and, and having it. Because usually, you go, oh gosh, I oh, oh, we can we can do that. We can, uh, <laughs> we can do that. Thanks to the technology. Do you feel like um, you've talked a lot about um, your, your new ideas and plans? And do you think, if you had to guess right now, do you think you'll outgrow this space? No. Okay. Or okay. we? Um, no. I, I mean, I don't want to. I. Uh, I'll answer first. You can. Say. Um, I don't want to outgrow this space because um, one of the things we're committed to, uh, turns out we're committed to, is Amherst, you know, and, we, and I was talking to this about a co right, having Amherst as be, being where we're from, Amherst has its own panache, you know, it's a great place to have a publishing company be from. If you're going to be in a small place, there's hardly a better in, in right to have it be fun. So that's mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. to be on the common. You know, this is a not a cheap space, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and but so outgrow and there's a fair amount of space 
Okay. Right. I would imagine us having, if we ever really grew beyond, we would have a, an additional space somewhere. Okay. We have a shop in Florence, yeah. which is another space to, to distribute books and all that. But in turn, it would be a while before we'd outgrow this space okay. if we ever did. Okay. Okay. And, it, and I think you would almost go into offset. You would have an offset component. Mm -hmm. yep. And I don't, s it won't be on my watch. Okay. <laughs> okay. It won't be on my watch. I'm never going back to Offset. Okay. Ever. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's a different culture too, right? Oh yeah. It's so it's so compartmentalized. Okay. Press operators are up against the bindery workers, and they're up against the oh. film people, play people. There's no crossover. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you except, all are going to except share. in worker co-ops, where. There's other worker co-ops that are offset presses. Okay. Red Sun Press is a sister shop. Salcedo okay. Press in Chicago. They're sister shops with us. Okay. Um, and they have this kind of being able to move between departments Beautiful. as part of their structure. Well, one of the things you all said you would do is uh, show us uh, what you do back there. Oh, yes. are you going to walk with your steady can? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so tour. we'll give you a little tour of what the uh, levelers off the common bindery is. You can see all the book covers up here that we've worked on, which we need to update it because we probably have another 30 we beyond do, yeah. this. <laughs> but this is wall. where they typically happen. Um, one of the books, one of those early books that we were very proud of is Paradise Printed and Bound. It's the story of printing in Northampton, which was part of that early thing, um, um, early books that we printed. Her, um, our folks in Florence uh, lay this out. They brought it over here. The digital files came here. So I, I laid it out and printed it and got it ready. And now I'll not move too fast. I'll move <laughs> slowly so you can cover me. Uh, going off to our new little cutter, which I'm so proud of. All through my printing career, I bought used equipment because new equipment was so expensive. But uh, people finally convinced me that rather than trying to repair old equipment, uh, occasionally, if it's not too expensive, you want to get a new piece of equipment. So this is a nice digital uh, cutter. Um, I kind of made this book, everything, so it would lay out well in a straight 8 and a half, 11 format. This is a guillotine. This is awesome. This is a guillotine. You can see why it's called a guillotine, right? So there you go. So we cut this. We printed this two up. And one of the great things about these machines, so on page five of this, there's one picture in That's color. Beautiful. Right? Um, and so we have our book block here. And... This, this is, you know, again, I don't know how, how you get into fast production on this, but this is our scoring machine, and it puts two crimps, it puts two crimps in the cover, like that, okay, and we, um, so, because we're waiting for our perfect binder to uh, to warm up, I'll show you. Here's our here's our paper down here. I'm gonna throw a little more in, and um, yeah, I'll just throw some of this in. These are the papers that come already pre-cut to size. And this is that size I was telling you about, 1319. We also get big mill sheets, oversized, which One, you don't, this size, more or oh less, yeah, yeah. and then cut them, cut them down, around. so okay. most of our books we run four up, four to a sheet, and that's a press sheet size, so All right, so we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to, this machine's waking up. I forget, that's from some kid's show. <laughs> All of them. You know, it's Mr. like Pee-wee's Pee Pee Playhouse. Let's go with Mr. Rogers. Huh? Instead. 
<laughs> so this, this, I think, if we can figure out some way to convey it, is part of the beauty of everything that's going. From this computer, I talk to all of our machines. So, and we name all our machines. Uh, this one that I'm printing to you now is called Shadowfax. Okay, and here's the job that uh, I'm going to print for you. So I, I was print making up some sheets that I had to repair, but now I'm going to print a whole set. And it's all programmed uh, size-wise, uh, whether it's color, black and white, where I'm going to tell it to deliver it to, the image quality, all this kind of stuff is done from here. And I just hit print, and it's all in register. And it goes there, and I can move that job to Bob the server if that if I want to. Bob Bob is our other one, and uh, Snoopy is our newest machine. So um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It was a reason, in a way, to go with one company. Zero. This is basically a Xerox kind of setup, and we've been with the same company for 15 years now or more. Um, so that's good. So it's it's pro it's processing again, but once it's there, it it'll move right along. And this is where uh, we are for showing you. This is the layout of a four up book. And these are, you know, this is the the, the customer from California, by the way. One of the wonderful things that's happened: UPS and even the Postal Service. We could compete to, you know, New York next day. UPS ground gets to New York City the next day. So we do a lot of work in New York, and this fellow is a great, these are all these kind of uh, really smart new urban designers wow. uh, from from uh, California. And so we're doing their book. And they because we've turned their books around so well, they, think, they tend to think we can do it all the time. That's great. So this book came in yesterday. It has to be in San Francisco on Wednesday next week. No kidding. So my goal is to ship it today so it gets there without it being like overnight. And so how many cost. copies? We're just printing 16 now for him to take to uh, Norway with him. No kidding. Really you know, it's exciting. just like, yeah, we, uh, our customers do exciting things. A lot of our customers do really exciting wow. things. Wow. So that's their job. And, and how does that make you feel to know yeah, that your well, outreach is worldwide? It, again, well, to be from in this little town, you know, a, a very special little town. A very special little town. I agree. One of the things you're you're always wanting to check is how your, your job lines up here. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Um, I didn't go full tilt. It's, I could move this over a smidge, but it's, you know what I mean? It's, well, that's incredible that you can like, hide that and just know. Yeah, so you know in that, where I was yeah. over there, I can just move that over. Okay. Just a little bit. Yeah, we're making adjustments at like the Every step of the way. And here's, the, here's what it can do for photographs. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And that big sheet, like I said, coming off, and it's just one eight and a half, which helps us do what we're doing. How are we doing over here? Did it wake up? This, it's doing, this is a self testing mode, and it's getting the glue stirred. You see the, oh, I see. You see the glue I getting see stirred the in there, it goes back and forth, it wants the glue to be. already so it's ready now so I just open up the clamps this is where you put it in so I, want, I would love to have more kids coming through to show them this oh, they you would know love it. you know it's just another thing we could do which yeah. would be fun to because it's I know, almost a like might, get them early get them into books early yes. books, I was gonna say I, I know a children's librarian that would be able to hook you all up yeah the, the problem is, how many different things can you do and still do yeah. what you normally do? All right, so now I'm uh, hitting the start button. And what you're going to hear is that sound, or this wheel down here, 
and it'll do it when it comes back again. It's waiting for the cover now. It's notching. It's notching the uh, the book. Um, I'll, I think I'll stop it and show it to you just for yuck's sake. Okay. So what that just did was to rough up the spine. Okay. You see that? That's so where. So the glue goes to. in there. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, and that makes that makes it that perfect bind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect conversation. <laughs> But, it's, I don't know, <laughs> can you imagine a perf calling this a perfect line? All right, so now I'm just getting this in position by getting that the scores we made lined up just where it wants to be for the book. So you have to do that all by hand, every single title, every single book. Yeah. Yeah. That's And now I'm hitting time. Yes. yes. That's why they cost something. <laughs> Charge for our labor. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Once you go beyond six by nine, really, or six and a quarter by nine and a quarter, yeah. it might as well be eight and a half, eleven, for what it's going to cost you. Oh, sure. Because we can then only print two up as opposed to four up, okay. if you know what I mean. Yeah. So yep. if you want your, if you're close to a six by nine book, don't go to six and a half or six and three quarters. But oh, I'm sorry. Or talk to me. Or talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the one who's. Got a name for myself already for designing weird size books. And so, do, do some people come in and actually want a bigger book? Oh well, yeah, yeah, and we and we okay. do that, and we can still compete yeah. because they know it's going to cost more. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fine. So I'm just going to trim it down. Yeah. Usually we would we've be got a nice and... we've got a nice laser light. One of the things I like about this cutter is that it tells you right where it's going to cut. So I'm going to I know where that's going to land. You're making it look easy, but I bet it's not. It takes a lot of practice to get it just the right spot. Um, uh, yeah. One of the things I'm going to do, which I should have thought of there, because I'm not cutting it with any slip sheets, is to change this cutting stick. See how it gets worn after sure, cuts and yeah. cuts? If you want to keep your, your uh, final sheet on the stack of paper you're cutting nice, you would do that. Um, How often do you have to change the blade? Um, you should, we change this, we change blades about once every three weeks. Oh, out wow. there, out wow. there where we cut more, back here not so much, um, not quite as much, so maybe once every two months on this machine. We send them off to get sharpened too. Oh, cool. We're trying to standardize our practices, so one thing I can do is, after I've cut off, see I just cut off all the crop marks, right? But I could eyeball an eighth, right? We're trying to make standard bleed as an eighth of an inch border. Yep. Okay. Um, I should do it the proper way. You're always cutting to have the blade come into the spine of the book, to have the, the least amount of nick on the book. So usually you're cutting for it at the time. Yeah, I'm usually. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Right. And it doesn't wiggle around. No, no that's what clamps. that's what this uh, clamp oh. is doing. So I'm bringing it down to a, a final size of that's... 10 inches. So there's our, there's our book. You I'm watched totally it. Geeking out right now. You, you watched <laughs> really it cool. from start to finish. That is so much fun. Most people have never seen anything like this, and I, it's an honor for me. Thank you for walking me through all this. Here you go. That's for you guys. Oh, that's so cool. I love this. Yeah, so take it with you. Before we say goodbye, I actually um, have something that uh, I want to um, kind of brag about. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to invite viewers to attend this year's Samuel Minot Jones Awards for Literary Achievement. It's the Jones Library's annual um, uh, literary uh, gala and uh, this year Steve will be accepting on behalf of Levelers Press and the, Anna too uh, uh, and Anna yeah, thank yeah, you I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> that awesome uh, the 2020 Sammy for significant contribution to Amherst literary culture and 
it will take the event will take place on April 30th, which is a Thursday, over at Amherst College, and we are really looking forward to having you. Yeah, it'll be fun. This has been so much fun, Steve. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. You rock. Thanks for coming.